we talked about uh, this process as needing to include depth, integration, and partnership. And then I said the, the, the content, we talked about the process, awakening, grounding, dreaming, discerning, realizing, okay? The content, mission, community, and stewardship. So how might that play out for your involvement? Who's involved in this kind of work and how are they involved? Well, what I want to give to you is a template that I've given to a lot of groups. Every group has taken it, tweaked it, molded it, shaped it for themselves. Uh, but I want to throw it out to you and then we'll do the molding um, and experiment with this a bit this afternoon. So those three groups, community, mission, and stewardship, I like to think of as lenses, ways in which to view your life. If you look at your vision for the future and you're looking through the lens of mission, what do you see? What does that need to look like? If you're looking through the lens of community, stewardship, what does that need to look like? So think of these as lenses, not so much committees or work groups and so forth. So in trying to create a structure, a way to go about this visioning process, I think we've got some dilemmas, uh, and I want to name this one, and it sort of gets to what you were uh, referencing. We have two values here, inclusion and effectiveness. Most groups are trying to embrace this notion of inclusivity and get away from hierarchical models of leadership per se and look at how can we partner more inclusively with one another because if you're not involved with it, you don't own it, okay? So how do we get everybody into a process of visioning that doesn't kill you <laughs> and is also effective? It's gotta be effective. The most efficient way to do the visioning would be to have Edward go away this afternoon, write it up and give it to you. And say, here's what we're gonna do, <laughs> and this is what it's gonna look like for 10 years out. Now, who would own that vision? Edward, Edward would. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe not even him. Okay, if you're involved in it, you're more likely to own it. That is so just basic and true. The more you put your stuff into it and work with it, and it's your, strong, it's your sweat equity, the more it becomes yours. So, that would be very efficient to do that. If you had your whole congregation meet once a month here, or in Rome or wherever, that would be extremely ineffective, okay, and inefficient. You might have ownership, but it'd probably kill you. <laughs> so how do you do this balance? What a lot of groups do is they meet once a year as a whole group and once every four to six years as a chapter. And there's not a lot of continuity to that. There are committees that may be at play at work or it's given, putting on the lap of leadership, they tap in a few core people. Uh, but oftentimes there isn't collective ownership for what the group is trying to work with. So how do you find a balancing act of some kind that is beyond chapter and beyond assemblies beyond the leadership team and beyond committees. So this is what I've suggested to groups as a way to try to create a different structure and way to go at things. We need to plan as a whole. You need to come together as a whole in some kind of way because that gives everybody the sense of the whole, the sense of the big picture. And you also need smaller working groups to do the legwork to move things through uh, because you can't do everything with a group of 100 people. So we're looking for depth and ownership, all those things down at the bottom. <laughs> that we're saying are, are really critical. So here's a, here's a way to go at it. Take these three areas of your life, community mission and stewardship, and create some visioning structures related to this, what I call core groups. So think of carving up your life into three core groups. And nested inside of each core groups will be these pieces, which I'll talk about in a moment. So three, you start to create three core groups, mission, community, and stewardship. And everybody in your congregation plugs in to one of these in some way. So no bystanders. Everybody's got to sort of say, I'm in this core group, one or the other. Inside each core group would be nested these sort of substructures or people involved in it. So you got the leadership team because they, they're holding all the spokes. They need to be involved in some way with every one of these groups. You've got a coordinating team, some coordinators to work with these groups. Get away from the word chair and so forth. Get a group of people who will coordinate and begin to do the, 
the legwork of some of this. You've got resource people, and those are people who are just, like the word says, resources. Uh, they wouldn't be standing part of the group, but they'd come in as needed because maybe what you're talking about now, they've really got something to offer and would be helpful. So resource people. And then you've got wisdom circles, which are anybody outside of the, the core working team. So those are the substructures. Now let me, I'll fill these out for you. So what are these three core groups? Their primary purpose for exi existing is to do visioning. They're your visioning structures. They are the engines of the visioning process. They are the lenses, the ones, the movers and shakers of this visioning process. So it's not a new structure of governance per se. It is a new structure in your, in your lives, but its primary purpose would be around visioning. It would include all of your members and then some potential partners, whoever you want to invite into this kind of process. And nested within each of those, again, uh, leadership, coordinating team, resource people, and wisdom circles. So the purpose is visioning. So what does leadership do? What's their role vis-a-vis -vis these core groups? Well, to partner, to collaborate, to support, challenge, and inspire all the things that leadership does. And hopefully walk the talk and to model for and with the groups uh, the kind of way of being together uh, that they hope to uh, in generate in, in the process. So their job is to coordinate, et cetera, et cetera. They need to be the sort of the glue, the center hub of all this. But they would be in each of these core groups. The coordinating team. The coordinating team may be two, three, four, five people. These are the worker bees. So let's say you had a coordinating team of four people with regard to mission. They're really doing the work of generating the material and the processes connected to whatever it is that they're claiming is important work relative to your mission. Same with stewardship, same with community. So those are the worker bees. Now these people are critical. They're not just there in a think tank, okay? These need to be people who are viable, functional, capable, and can get things going because there needs to be action as well as depth of conversation and so forth. So two to five people, you may or may not want to consider laity in that. Uh, that, that comes with a mixed bag of pros and cons, uh, but you may want laity. Maybe you don't have enough resources otherwise. You may want a lay person in your stewardship group because they've been centrally involved in your finances, although stewardship is bigger than finances. But it could be at some point, let's say you're involved in selling property or doing something with regard to your finances, they would be critical, okay? So maybe they're a resource person. So that's your worker bees to coordinate the work of each of those core groups. The resource people are these knowledgeable people who will stretch your thinking, not always experts, but sometimes people who can just help you think outside the box. Um, so maybe you get Richard Rohr into one of these conversations, or maybe you get some other people that you think, wow, this person could really stretch us. Let's bring them in. Let's have some conversations with them. Bring them at the table. They wouldn't be standing part of the core groups. They can't give their lives to this. Uh, but at key junctures, at key pieces, you think, wow, let's bring these people in. That would be really helpful to us right now. So they're remarkable people, stretching people, et cetera. And think flexible, permeable boundaries. You know, don't, you create these core groups, don't put a big picket fence around it. Think about, you know, letting people in and out of these so that you have the people you need that are relative to the work that you're doing. So that's resource people. The wisdom circle is everybody else in your congregation. Somehow they're plugged in to the process. I want to even consider your most elder men in your community. Maybe they're in a skilled care unit. Maybe they're in a facility of some kind. You know what, I find that those are people being involved in this in whatever capacity they can is critical. I don't just do that in a perfunctory way. It's not just, oh, throw them a bone and let them feel involved. Uh, but sometimes meeting with them, helping them appreciate little pieces of this along the way, getting their thoughts and wisdom, more importantly, getting the sense of being in it together. So critical. So I think that you obviously have different men at different capacities to do different kinds of things. It's up to the core team 
to say, okay, we've got these 30 other men that want to be involved in mission somehow. How do we engage them? Maybe it's a meeting face-to-face. -face. You can't do those a lot or all the time and certainly not extended. Um, maybe it's surveys. Maybe you fan out and meet in small groups. Uh, maybe it's just communication occasionally. But the goal here is to tap their wisdom, get their involvement, seeking their ownership, and making sure that you have a sense of everybody's in. Everybody's in the pool together, whatever capacities they have. So that's the wisdom circle. It's everybody else outside of the core teams and leadership. <coughs> Another structure that is helpful here is the integration team. Let's say you have, okay, you have three core teams, community, stewardship, mission, and you have them maybe in three regions, Kenya, Congo, United States. Or maybe you make it different. But let's just say, for example, now, you've got three core groups in three uh, regions. So you've got about 18 people, therefore, plus leadership. Okay, so these are your strongest worker bees. We've now spread the table from your, how many do you have in your general council? Seven. Seven. Now you've got 21 people moving this along on the same page, pulling it together. And now we also have different, the different worlds like you do in this room. It would be like in this room, you've got the different countries represented and a great opportunity for cross-fertilization. And this group begins to collaborate and work together on the visioning effort. Because Africa and the United States and wherever else you are, you need to figure out how are we becoming one in this process. This is a very rich opportunity. It's a very expensive, financially expensive, and time-consuming opportunity. And it's a critical, critical piece. It really is helpful to do this integration team conversation uh, along the way of the vision. How frequently they meet, it's whatever you can manage as a group. You know, with groups that are localized and together, that integration team meetings every four to six weeks. With groups like yourselves that are international, it presents a huge challenge. Uh, so maybe you'd meet twice a year. I'd like you to meet three times a year. I know it's all a stretch, so you negotiate that, you figure it out, or maybe this doesn't work, okay? All I'm saying for some groups, that cross-fertilization collaboration, you talk about oneness and the synergy that can happen when you pull these different parts together, essential. So think that possibility as well. Who are the people that come? Maybe two from each of the core groups of the coordinating team. And those can be different people, so you're not always uh, demanding the same level of involvement from everybody. Okay, so those are the structures, core groups plus an integration team. Um, timeline, this is, uh, you know, not worth much <laughs> because it's hard to know exactly what you, what you plan on doing and, and the pace at which you plan on doing it. But if you take these five elements of the visioning piece, it's an ongoing, really, a better picture, but I can't do it graphically as a spiral uh, because you're really circling through these dynamics of the visioning process all throughout. When does it end? Does it ever? I don't know. I think the groups that I've been involved in, it's not like there's a finish line they cross. Uh, they continue to evolve and morph and work with it in some way. Uh, what I find very helpful um, this might frighten you, and again, you may not want to do this, but what I have found really helpful is that bridging from one chapter into another chapter with this effort is very helpful. So it's not new team, new regime, new program, new consultants, new efforts. That discontinuity is so frustrating for groups. But create a bridge across chapters is very, very helpful. So my work with groups, I think I shared with the leadership team, is typically long-term if I commit to a group, uh, long-term meaning multi-years across chapters. So I've worked with groups on average probably around six years, seven years. I've worked as long as 12 years. Um, I'm not advocating that and I'm not pushing myself here. All I'm saying is whatever you choose to do, whether it's with me or someone else, my hope would be that you lay down tracks and you keep going, letting it evolve and morph and that whatever your next chapter 
is, whenever that is, that you're continuing to look at chapter not as now a new pinnacle of a moment, but an ongoing opportunity to go further with what you've begun and to take that and claim that and morph that uh, in a continuous way. So you don't have the discontinuity chapter to chapter. And your election of leadership would be obviously to support whatever you've laid down as tracks. Um, so that's a brief scary thought about timeline. One last piece, or I'm getting close to the last piece, dilemma that, that folks struggle with is, well, we need to make a decision about this international community, but we don't have a vision. What's our vision? Or we need to have the vision before we can make all these decisions. That's a constant tension. You can't wait 10 years to have some fantastic vision before you make really decisions that are probably in your face. And, and you don't want to make these decisions that are in your face now uh, with any disregard to what you are trying to evolve and stretch yourselves into the future. So you're constantly working with this tension uh, of what do we decide today and how does that speak to what we're evolving into into the future. It's just part of the, part of the mess of it all. Um, so it's learning how to deal with the ambiguity, that mess, uh, taking it one step at a time, knowing that the, uh, I, I don't believe that there's like a vision that you will claim. I don't, that doesn't typically happen for groups. You'll, you'll get mosaic pieces of that vision. It will evolve. Moses barely got a glimpse, okay? <laughs> barely got a glimpse. So I don't know that there's any community that has waved the flag and said, we've arrived, we have the vision for the future, and here it is. No, it's not like one final finish line. It's, again, a work in progress, uh, but something that you become more sure-footed with the longer you live into it, but it continues to morph and change with every group I've been with. So it's a little bit like this, this notion of timeline is, if, this is my best effort to draw a cycle. Um, so you're cycling through this process of dreaming and awakening and so forth all the way through. It's a continuous kind of process. Uh, this is the last piece. Okay, the partnership piece. This speaks to your notion of in, uh, interdependence, to inclusivity. This is so critical. Your leadership cannot do this for you. They can't transform you. Only you can do that collectively. And leadership can't pull you along. They need your partnership. So the partnership between leadership and membership, the partnership between members and other people you might invite into the process, I believe is a, such a critical piece. Um, Ira Scherleff uh, wrote a book called uh, Courageous Followership. Have you read this book? Okay, Shift in Consciousness. Instead of thinking command and control, hierarchical leadership, what he's proposing is, what's the strength of your followership? You know, how many are raised to say, I want to be a good follower? <laughs> you know, for most people that has a sour taste. We're raised to be leaders. We were supposed to be leaders. That's, that's what people are encouraging us to do. But where is the parity and the partnership with followership? That's a real critical piece. So part of the work of this process, I believe, is to strengthen your capacity to be partners, for members to speak the truth, encourage, to leadership and vice versa, so that together you're really working at this. And instead of a vision evolving around leadership, it's more others, the partnership, evolving around and shaping the vision. It's a great little book if you ever get a chance to read it. Okay, Ira Scherleff, C-H-R-A-L-E-F-F, -F, I think, <coughs> something like that. Courageous followership. If you get it on, look on Amazon, you'll find it.